Welcome to the Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. What did George Washington do that you might not know about? What did Abe Lincoln know that could change the way you think about the Civil War? You'll learn about all that and more on this special show designed to restore excitement in American history. Let's get started. So we are here today with Doug Bradburn, founding director of Mount Vernon's Fred W. Smith National Library. And before we launch into our Q&A and talk a little bit more with Doug, let's tell our viewers a little bit about your background. Before becoming the founding director of the library here at Mount Vernon, Doug was a professor and director of graduate studies in the history department at Binghamton University. He taught college level classes at a variety of institutions, held two year long fellowships, earned a PhD in history from the University of Chicago, and got his BA in history and economics from the University of Virginia. Doug is a specialist in the history of the American Revolution and the founding of the United States and has published numerous articles and book chapters on topics related to the great problems of the revolutionary age. In fact, he is the author of the 2009 book, The Citizen Revolution, Politics and the Creation of the American Union from 1774 to 1804. So we are gonna mine down into all that interesting information that's in your head, Doug, with this Q&A. So our first question is this. George Washington's mother had a reputation of being difficult. So, and, and may have contributed to driving him to Mount Vernon. Right, so Mary Ball Washington, uh, Washington's mother does have that reputation of being sort of a really driven woman, a controlling woman, kind of uh, shrewish in her way. Um, but that's a reputation that's kind of a latter day reputation of her. In the beginning, she was in the 19th century, in particular in the sort of romantic 19th century, she's seen as this sort of the, the great mother of Washington, the, 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 the example of all great motherhood in this young republic. You can raise this virtuous, honest man through her pious and moral ways. And she's held up as this paragon. And in fact, the first monument, national monument to a woman in American history is, is to uh, Mary Ball Washington in Fredericksburg. I think, in fact, uh, President Jackson, Andrew Jackson is there, the unveiling of this marble um, uh, monument, which was never completed ultimately. Uh, and so her reputation has kind of been in, in different places over time. All historians agree that she's very important to understanding George Washington, and it, and it would be helpful to know a little bit more about her inner life. Uh, she clearly was uh, seen in the 19th century as very religious. Uh, in the 20th century, that is, turns into kind of this critique of the Victorian religion, you know, that she's too strict and too constraining, and Washington's trying to get away. He's going to run off to join the Navy, he's going to run off to join the Army, he's going to move to Mount Vernon and, and not go to Fredericksburg very much. It's really hard to say what she was like, although the extant letters we have between her and George Washington don't always cast her in the most favorable light. You see, she kind of comes off as someone always asking for money. Uh, at one point, you know, he, he, she's complaining about her living space and he invites her to live at Mount Vernon to live with them, but then he he kind of takes the invitation back by saying, well, you won't like it here at all because it's filled with visitors all the time. And so you wouldn't have any peace and quiet and a woman of your age should be somewhere where she has peace and quiet. So the extant letters speak to a, a relationship that is strained, but it's, it's hard to say how much we're imposing on that the sort of modern psychology of, uh, of the relationship, but it is tantalizing because he is so hard to get at as a real person. You know, understanding his mother would be a wonderful way to, to do it. All right, so let's say there's a little rebellion mm -hmm. on his end. The woman, the first woman he falls in love with is Sally Fairfax. Doesn't get her. Ends up with Martha. It's kind of an arranged marriage, quote unquote. <laughs> but they end up falling in love with each other. So, what kind of husband, do you know what kind of husband he was to her and to her children who he adopted? Um, and how much is known about the intimate side of him? 
Hmm. And them. The great question about the romantic character of the relationship of Martha and George. And uh, it, again, another way to try to get at the humanity of this person is through those, those intimate relationships, love affairs, uh, marriage. Uh, again, it's ambiguous in, in a way because it's the 18th century and their letters are always sort of dancing around you know, uh, the, you know, the real feelings that are expressed. They're often clouded with metaphors and references to the history. Um, and that's what you see in some of his early letters with Sally Fairfax, which will allow a lot of people to imply this sort of strong, passionate love. Um, he marries Martha Dandridge Custis, who's the wealthiest widow in Virginia at the time. He, he marries her and, and sets up, he, you know, he gives up his commission as an officer, he leaves the French and Indian War and starts transforming Mount Vernon into a really working, large-scale plantation. They go on to have a very successful life together, by all intents and purposes, a, a successful marriage that lasts a, a long time till his death, uh, obviously. Um, they never have any issue of their own, any children of their own, um, but she has two children from her earlier marriage that he treats as his own. And they uh, they die at a relatively early age, and so their children, uh, George and Martha, raise as their own at Mount Vernon. Uh, and in fact, George refers to them as his own children in that manner. Um, and not only those children, but nieces of Martha's and, and nephews of his own, he pays for their education. Uh, so some of his brother's children he provides for their education and invites him, them into his household at certain times. So he really is playing out the role of the patrifamilias of this extended and powerful family. Uh, and, and she's playing out the role of a very devoted wife. Uh, and clearly there's a great amount of affection there. She travels with him throughout the American Revolutionary War, and particularly when they're in winter quarters. She's visiting them, visiting the troops, sustaining him in a crucial way. Now, Getting at their relationship is much harder than getting at, say, John Adams and Abigail Adams, because what we have with John and Abigail Adams is a tremendous correspondence between the two of them. Partly that's because they're away from each other for much of their life. I mean, you know, John Adams is in Europe or all over the place, and so they're corresponding a lot. George and Martha also have a correspondence, but it is destroyed by uh, Martha Washington uh, near the end of her life. And this is not unusual. We see this with Jefferson's wife, as him destroyed their intimate correspondence. He's such a public figure by the end of his life, it's clear that his papers are going to be of interest. And Martha clearly wants to keep their uh, private thoughts between each other private. So we do have uh, in this library this great letter that he wrote to her in 1775, in which he says, I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. So we get these little snippets, you know, of, of a possible romantic uh, relationship. But it's, many historians believe that it wasn't that, that, that he didn't have that strong of a connection in that way. And there's evidences of flirtations that he would have with other women. Uh, the Powell family, uh, uh, Elizabeth Willing Powell uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia was a very vivacious and important social leader, good friend of Martha's. It's clear that he bantered with her in a friendly way. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't have anyone saying that he bantered a lot with Martha because maybe it's not newsworthy to write that you're talking to your wife in this you know, coquettish sort of way. Uh, you know, so it's hard, again, to really get at that, uh, that romantic connection. But, but as a man, he, was, you know, he loved to dance. He was often on the dance floor with the ladies at the balls for many hours at a time. And he liked the conviviality of close friends. It's clear that he didn't have, you know, an extensive group of, of male friends that were intimate uh, in that way in conversation with him. But, but it's clear that when he was with them, that he enjoyed a good anecdote, a good joke, uh, and a good drink, and, and had a good time with close friends as well. And Washington was a real visionary. Mm. He believed in business and commerce and the growth of the nation. Tell us a little bit about the business side of him. Well, as a visionary, I think to start with a visionary, um, here you have to imagine a guy that grew up when the North American continent east of the Mississippi River is controlled by many different nations. It's controlled by the French, the Spanish, the English, 
a lot of Native Americans. And he comes to articulate and really believe in a vision of this one united country of these independent states dominating that whole region. I mean, the, the very ability to imagine that the world you grew up in can be different in the future requires that kind of tremendous vision. And I think, you know, to get back at kind of where that came from, I mean, he's a surveyor at a very early age. And what do surveyors do? Well, surveyors take a piece of ground, the stream and the wilderness, and they turn it into a formal piece of property by measuring it out and, and then describing it and writing it out. Vision is all about you know, creating some kind of order from disorder. And Washington is clearly obsessed with order throughout his life. You know, and, and trying to order things and improve things leads directly into his own entrepreneurship as well. It seems like uh, Washington's entrepreneurship was a fact. Mm. Whereas Jefferson's was more of a, an affair of the mind. I, I, do, I do think that's a good a description. I mean, Jefferson is sort of a philosoph in the Enlightenment, and, and Washington is an enlightened farmer. You know, he's, he's out there putting things into place. Jefferson, of course, was always experimenting with crops as well as Washington. In fact, they have a great correspondence with each other, you know, uh, sharing seeds, sharing techniques, etc. Jefferson designs a plow that nobody ends up using, but, it, but mathematically it's supposed to be the perfect plow. Washington designs a plow that drops seeds uh, at the same time as it's plowing, that farmers come from all around the region to copy and to use. So they are sharing this sort of interest in improvement, interest in edification, but Washington is definitely more interested in what he can get done in the here and now. Which is interesting, and it makes perfect sense given who he was in history. Yeah. And talk a little bit about his honesty, the whole cherry tree mythology, right. which we understand today to be a myth. Where did that come from, that, <laughs> that story? So Parson Weems is this you know, preacher, itinerant preacher, and also a parson at one of the local churches here, uh, who visited Mount Vernon in the 1780s, met Washington, ostensibly during his visit, went down to Fredericksburg to collect lots of stories about the man, and he wanted to write a biography of Washington in the late 1790s. Washington dies in 1799, and Weems very quickly sees a great opportunity here. Many people will want to know about this man's story, about his life, and he is pitching this book to Matthew Carey in Philadelphia and some other publishers of the, the true stories of Washington. The first of many biographers who are trying to get at the real man of Washington. That's been the dilemma from day one. And Parson Weems does it by ostensibly interviewing lots of people who live in Fredericksburg and telling these stories of his youth. And one of those stories is the what has become known as the myth of the cherry tree, um, which became a really important way to, to for 19th century folk to tell people about how to behave. So here you have this great man, the founder of the United States, who as a young child was so known for his honesty that he did these different things. One of those was he had a, a hatchet, he scraped the bark off of his father's favorite cherry tree or somebody's tr cherry tree, the tree dies or is damaged. His father asks him, you know, uh, what do you know about this? And he cannot tell a lie, right? He, he I did it, I destroyed the cherry tree. But he clearly was a man obsessed with his own honor, with truth-telling, which is crucially about his reputation. And he said, if I have one reputation, I hope it is the character of an honest murderer. So the reputation was everything uh, from his point of view. And, and this is the 18th century. You know, you're, you can't go to a bank and get your credit rating. I mean, you are what people think you are. Your reputation is what allows you to move in society. And as a boy that grew up without a father, I think that early on that that was made very clear to him, that he's not going to get anything if he isn't seen as a trustworthy, dependable uh, person uh, who carries through in their work. And yeah. two things I really want you to talk about. One that's a little bit fun, that he was a fantastic spy, which mm. kind of goes contrary to the honesty piece, but still mm. military background. Yeah. And also a little bit about being a slave owner and how controversial that was at the time. So Great. let's go with the fun part. Talk about him being a spy master. Okay, yes. So Washington put together one of the most significant intelligence operations uh, in the 18th century in the cold course of the American Revolution. He's commander in chief for eight years uh, in, the, in the course of this war. And in doing that, he uses all the efforts he can to bring in intelligence. 
you know, and modern intelligence gatherers will tell you, you know, you get it from all different sources. You have to get multiple levels of things so you know what's true and what's not true. And, and the sexiest aspect of his intelligence gathering is the spies that he cultivated. And these could range from sort of one-off people that uh, information is being paid for to more extensive uh, rings of spies. He had a ring of spies around Philadelphia, and most famously he had the Culper Ring in Long Island, essentially to keep an eye on British movements in New York. So the British controlled New York throughout the bulk of the American Revolution, New York City. Their uh, commander-in-chief was there in New York City. That's the headquarters of all their sort of North American operations. And so he had spies like in the heart of the city itself, and in Long Island that could easily get information back to him. And that's what the culpers were set up to do. And they use secret ink, and they use all kinds of codes to communicate with each other. And uh, it's really a dramatic moment in the, you know, in the intelligence gathering of the revolution. Was he 711? Was that his code? That's right. He was 711, was uh, George Washington. Is there a significance to that? And no, there wasn't a significance to it because you didn't want to have a significance to it, otherwise then people could figure it out, right? So it was just the number that was assigned to him when they developed this code. Maybe we got 7-Eleven from that or <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell Smart. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. 86. 86. <laughs> right. So now let's talk about um, his, his reputation as being a slave owner, right. but a kind one. Well, so Washington grows up in a society in which the main labor force is an enslaved labor force, and people descended from Africans and Africans who are in hereditary slavery. Uh, it's a legal system that really comes together before he's born, you know, in the late 17th century and early 18th century, so much so that he inherits slaves when his father dies at 11 years old. He is the owner of 10 or 11 people. They're under the control of his mother as regent. Uh, she will have control over his you know, property until he reaches the age of maturity. And maybe that's where some of the tension between mother and son comes from. You see, he is growing up as the eldest male in a household. She doesn't remarry, but she controls all his property that he's inherited, including these enslaved people, including land. You know, so he, he, he at an early age then is, is, is used to being serious. I mean, when you're, when you're a slave owner, you're in charge of other people's livelihood. Uh, all the food they have, all the clothes they wear, where they live, uh, that's all in, in charge of the master. And so your own reputation as a gentleman is going to be reflected by how your property, your enslaved property are treated as well. So he, he has kind of responsibilities thrust upon him that most 11-year-olds can't imagine when you think about it in those terms. Now, slavery as a labor regime is a brutal one by any modern standards. It is ultimately based upon a relationship of violence. You have to be able to force people to work. Uh, and, and from all intents and purposes, Washington managed his labor in ways that were consistent with 18th century uh, labor management. Um, now, what we see over time at Mount Vernon as his estates expand is a couple of things, a changing understanding of Washington to his laborers as, as human beings and their own needs, and a changing understanding of Washington to the institution of slavery in the abstract as, as a system of doing things, as, as you know, whether it's a, a positive or a negative uh, in the development of America. And I think what we see, therefore, is over time, Washington very much believes that he's not going to uh, sell any families, uh, enslaved people. He's not going to allow families to be broken up. And we also see, certainly by the 1780s, that he's trying to understand ways to get rid of slavery in the abstract en masse. He says in a letter in the 1780s that it, it's a system that he no more person, no person more than he wants to see the system gotten rid of. It has to be done by active legislation. Uh, he's encouraging people to experiment with ways. The Marquis de Lafayette has a notion to buy a plantation in the West Indies and try to free slaves and keep them on as sort of free laborers. Washington's encouraging him to try these things. Um, Washington's godson, Ferdinando Fairfax, publishes one of the first plans of emancipation uh, ever published in America in 1790, 
uh, Fairfax is here very often in the 1780s. And you kind of can read that. I would argue you could read that essay as something, you know, answering a question from Washington, how can this be done? You know, how can you end slavery in a way? Um, ultimately, of course, Washington doesn't free his slaves. The people under his charge uh, sometimes try to run away, and he aggressively tries to bring them back when they do. Very common and expected from masters in his age. Uh, he does, in his will, free all the slaves that he owns by his own right. Uh, he controls many other slaves that are Martha's uh, inheritance, from, but, and then are going to the Custis family that he is not able to free. But he is the only president of the United States who owns slaves that frees them in his will. He's the only one to ever do that. And it's clear that he's trying to send a message uh, to encourage emulation. But the country is really growing more dependent, particularly the South, is growing more dependent on slave labor as his, you know, towards the end of his life than it is in the middle of his life. Um, the cotton expansion of cotton, uh, the needs for labor as that expands, have you know changed the dynamic a little bit. So, as a slave owner, he is representative of his class. Uh, he doesn't use violence aggressively. Um, he does allow his overseers to correct his slaves at times. Uh, and over and over in the course of his life, we see this growing frustration with the system of slavery as a, as an institution uh, of injustice uh, that. Uh, he is not able to figure out a way to end. Do you think he would have expected to, one, be remembered after 215 years, and two, have such a revered place in history? I think he would be shocked at what the country has become in many ways. It's just very, you can't imagine, you know, planes and the internet and all these sorts of, I mean, this would be completely beyond his ability to comprehend. But I think he would have believed that his fame was something that would last through time. I mean, remember, here is a guy who is, you know, very much thinking about Roman heroes and his people he's emulating, you know, Cato and Rome and, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Cincinnatus, these Roman generals who resign uh, after they, they leave their farm, they come out, they fight wars, and then they resign. He's reenacting, at least in his own mind, this kind of uh, historical stories of, of, of greatness. And, uh, and he's celebrated, remember, in his lifetime as this sort of trans-historical figure, statues being made of him, statues that are going to sit outside the Capitol in Richmond, and statues that are going to be... He has a city named after him, Washington, D.C. in his lifetime. So I think he would have been, I think he expected his name to last for generations. And, you know, when they, when these guys waxed poetic about the future of America, they talked about, you know, centuries to come. They talked about millions unborn. They talked about a, a, you know, a legacy of fame that was eternal. Um, now, how much of that is rhetoric of the time and how much, you know, he really thought, well, boy, they're really going to remember me. That's hard to get. Again, that's the sort of facade he's laying out because he's, he's projecting that image of himself for history. And that's one reason why he's keeping people at such arm's length. You know, he really is projecting a, uh, you know, a statue uh, of virtue to, for the country to, to emulate and live up to. And, uh, now, he might say, that's bunk, that's ridiculous, what are you talking about? You don't know what you're talking about. But it's hard to say, because he didn't write like that. You know, His motto on his family crest is Exodus Acta Probat, which means the result is the test of the action. He writes letters very often saying things like, uh, I never want to have my designs be revealed by my expressions, but rather by my deeds. Sort of actions speak louder than words. He's not writing an autobiography like Ben Franklin. He's not writing a bunch of letters in his old age, like John Adams complaining that Mercy Otis Warren got him wrong in the history of the revolution, and how come nobody understands the revolution, and I did this, and you know Joseph Warren did that. And he doesn't write letter, an annus, the political annus that Jefferson writes, which sort of justifies all Jefferson's little political maneuvers and flip-flopping in the 1790s. Washington just says, I lived my life, and it's going to stand for what it stands for. So that's what we're left with, is the man whose actions are going to speak for his designs. So thank you so much, Doug. You are definitely a great spokesman for this amazing man. So we are here at the... Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington, right here at Mount Vernon.
And thank you, David and Hope, for giving me a chance to talk about uh, him and his great life. Yes, the man behind the mythology. And next, we're going to go over and interview Kurt V. Brantz, who is the president and CEO of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. We're going to get a tour of the fabulous facade and the home where George Washington lives, and also the education center. And we're going to learn about him as a hero. Thank you so much for your time. We'll talk to you soon. You have been listening to The Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. Here's to restoring enthusiasm in history for kids and adults, too.